Hello, I'm Gary Crowley and welcome to Tune, the online mix of music and conversation. On this week's show, our Professor of Pop will be talking about the cult UK TV series, The Prisoner. Our producer, Emma, catches up with new rock and roll band, The Echo Raptors. And Terry Hooley from Good Vibrations will be giving us his top ten. But first, I had the honour to meet up with one of the punk new wave greats. Buzzcox guitarist Steve Diggle. Always a pleasure to see you. I thought we had to start the interview here today because this place has got a lot of memories for you, isn't it? Take us back to 1976 and the Punk Festival. Yeah, back in 1976, of course, we opened up in Manchester for the Sex Pistols. And then um, within about a month or something, suddenly was here at the 100 Club, you know. I think we turned up in a little van, you know, probably all sat in the back. And we came in, it was um, a two-day punk festival. I think the Pistols and the Clash were uh, they was on the first day, then it was uh, Buzzcocks and the Dam the second day. Right. Did you have any kind of sense that, you know, that this was going to be something important that people would be talking about years to come? You kind of had to do a double take because it did seem in some ways that this is going beyond like a couple of gigs, you know. It, it felt like the wheels were getting in motion to something bigger, you know, because the crowd, the, the attention around it was just, you know, sweeping the nation in a yeah. way and it, but it you know started off in little places like this you know yeah. Steve the Buzzcocks were the first band to put out um, an independent release the Spiral Scratch EP we just thought we're making the most uncommercial music possible so we went to a record company that probably asked us to leave immediately so um, we thought, it, somehow come around to the idea that you can make your own single for 500 pounds, you know. So that's what we did. And um, part of it's seen as a stroke of genius, you know. But, you know, part of it was necessity, you know. Yeah. But it, it meant, um, amazingly, all of a sudden, we, we had a single, you know, for yeah. 500 pounds. So, and John Peel was playing it. Yeah, yeah. And, then and it that seems... inspired a lot of people to go and do the thing. I mean, it seems weird thinking about it now, but, you know, myself as a fan, looking back at that time, yeah. you guys were on top of the pops every week. I mean, it seemed to happen mm. incredibly quickly. Did yeah. it feel like that at the time? And yeah. also, did you remember to enjoy it as well? I mean, you know, what are the <laughs> memories like? Can you um... remember any of it? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, it suddenly became a whirlwind thing, but you kind of had this inbuilt sort of gyroscope thing that this is all going to happen. And even if it didn't, you, you wasn't really that worried. But at the same time, you thought, this just keeps happening, getting bigger and better. I mean, we was doing lots of gigs, you know, you start off doing these little gigs in weird clubs, then universities, then it was getting like to the Hammersmith Odeons yeah. and Manchester Apollos yeah. and all this. And so tours, the it, White it Riot Tour. The White and... Riot Tour we did, yeah, and some of the Anarchy Tour. But yeah, we, we had a great time on the White Riot Tour, you know, and then suddenly we are doing our own tours like that. Talk about this place as well, I mean, the Marquee. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, would the Buscocks have played here? I mean, um, what memories of, of playing we, here as well? We played here many times. Um, I forget how many times, but we did it quite a few times. And just fast forward, because the band came back together again in the late 80s, yeah. um, you know, just as the whole kind of grunge thing was yeah. kicking off in America. And those bands loved you as well, didn't they? I mean, Nirvana, yeah. Pearl Jam, both of them invited you to go on tour with them. Yeah. In fact, you, you, you were Nirvana's final sort of special guest support band on tour, weren't you? And I know yes. you've got a lot of memories of... We were, we, um, yeah, I mean, they, when uh, the Nevermind album and Teen Spirit was number one in America, they came to see us in Boston. And um, we came off the stage and they were, they were all came in the dressing room. And uh, I had six televisions behind me. It was a, a, a tour we had called the Trade Test Transmission Tour. And uh, we used to take televisions with us all around, all around America, all around Britain and Europe. And I used to smash them every night, you know. So uh, Kurt said, you know, he liked the way I smashed the televisions. And I said, there's an art to it, you have to throw it and let go and it has to hit the screen so it implodes and get the smoke. Otherwise, if you go through it, you can get an electric shock, you know. That was great, we hung around with them and um, we inspired each other because it was an exchange of what the British punk was and what American grunge was, you know. 
I mean, we were talking about, um, you know, some of the grunge bands there. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, you know, loads of the Britpop bands yeah. cited um, the Buscox as a massive influence, yeah, yeah. didn't they? Oh, yeah, they influenced a lot of them, you know. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm sure they're all influenced by that, Blur, yeah. Oasis and stuff. We've played as good compliments, you yeah. know, and we love them. It's a continuing thing, a yeah. continuing thing. Talking of continuing things, yeah. this is a special place for you here, yeah. isn't it? The piano shop here. Yeah. I bought a few pianos here. Shall we, um, we jump in and go and have a laugh? <laughs> Bring it right up to date, yeah. The ninth studio album for the Buzzcocks. It's called The Way. Mm. Where does this album find, uh, you know, the Buzzcocks nearly 40 years down the line? And it still sounds as good as ever. There's lightness and darkness on it, you know. It's, um, and it's the Buzzcocks um, as what we are now. now to find out what new band our producer Emma is interviewing. This week I'm in my hometown of Belfast catching up with local band The Echo Raptors. Well, change, change my way, never coming back again, and how we sad to know, everything was taken Found you on the side of the road. I might describe it as big melodic rock and roll albums. Catchy songs, just good tunes. People all like can relate to. You can hear the influences in the music, like it's the Beatles and uh, Oasis, the Verve. Most all the nineties, sixties good stuff, but we'll have other wee stuff for like as well. So we all have our own influences and I think when we come and when we're writing a song it bring it to the table, it all sort of melts together and stuff, so works good that way. Coming back again. Who wrote Change My Way? I was me, I wrote that one. By myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in the house one day and the Melody just came to me, the chorus melody of that song, which rare because I usually have the chords first, but didn't have any chords for it. And then it just kept going through my head that melody and uh, worked out the chords for it and brought it down to practice, let them in here. And they, they were really into it. And then we just, I think at like an hour or something, I had the song near complete. And we knew afterwards, we were like, yeah, that's a good one, that though, I had to put that out. And um, what's the band's philosophy? The band philosophy, I think we can all agree, is great, great songs, first of all, and then great live shows. If you have a great song, you can do it justice in the studio, but then you have to do it even more justice out on the stage, and that's what we pride ourselves in. There's not one person, whether they despise us or not, they, they have to say themselves. The boys can play on stage. Like. A teenage dream, so hard to beat Every time she walks down the street Another girl in the neighborhood. I wish she's mine, she looks so good. I wanna hold her, wanna hold her tight. Get a teenage kicks right through the night. One word to describe the Oh, you talk right over it. That was just one big moment. That was just big moment. Stop her. Stop her. Stop her. Awesome. One word. One word to describe the Echo Raptors. Unreal. All right. Teenage Kicks is an appropriate song to introduce our next guest, Terry Hooley, from Good Vibrations in Belfast. Right through the night. I have to say Rolling Stones in their early days were just amazing, fantastic. Uh, met them on their first visit to Belfast, really nice people at that time. I don't know what they're like now, <laughs> but the only doubt it would have been the Rolling Stones. It's been the favourite song for 40 years, so why change it now? Past, present and the future of the shangri -Las. That's easy, Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? What a classic album. Bob Marley, Bob Marley's dear friend and 
semi out of doubt. One of the nicest human beings I've ever met. JD Salinger, Franny and Zoe. There's a bit in it, uh, it's a letter that goes, ego, 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 I'm sick and tired of my own ego and everybody else's ego. It makes me sick. John Peel, obviously, he's just uh, the greatest. First met John in the 60s, obviously changed my life by playing teenage cricks twice in a row, it was unheard of. The April Fools with Jack Lemon and Catherine Deneuve. I love women, that's what I do. Love women and drinking. I hate bigots and racists, we had a doubt. Fascists, I hate them with passion. Belfast Purist Record Store. Now let's step into the world of Wales with our resident professor of pop. Hi, I'm Simon Wells, and this week I'm talking about the television series The Prisoner. What's it all about? It's insoluble. What is The Prisoner? You think of Sergeant Pepper as the most vibrant representation of the summer of love. The prisoner manages to top that. But what's it all about? It's about a chap called Patrick McGoon, Britain's highest paid television actor. A man so principled that he turned down the Saint and James Bond because of girls, because of guns. He had his own series, Danger Man, most popular cop agent show of the 1960s. At its peak, after 80 episodes, he'd had enough. The formula of it bored him. He wanted to do something special. He went to Lou Grade, the head of ATV, and said, I want to do something special. Lou Grade gave him the money. He went off to North Wales to a village called Port Mirian, a psychedelic vision of architecture, Italianette design. And there was the base for his series, The Prisoner. The story involves a secret agent who resigns and is kidnapped to this village. And over 17 episodes, they try to get out of him the reasons for his resignation. They torture him. They fill him full of hallucinogenic drugs, but still he won't give them the answer. And while he cannot escape, he retains his integrity. The 17th episode is the final episode of this series which blew collective minds across the country. The Beatles were so impressed with what went on, they called McGowan in the day after to explain what went on. And what went on? McGowan, in the final episode, explored the realms of his mind which had spilled out over the prisoner to realise that the actual number one, the person he'd been seeking throughout the series, was in fact himself. The prisoner's weird. It's weird. It's when weird gets weird. It's weirder than weird. And it's the greatest television series of its kind as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Next time round on Tune, we'll have more from our professor of pop. Guitar great Andy Fairweather Lowe joins me for a chat. Emma interviews quirky singer-songwriter Kate Ferris. And top boy Ashley Waters answers the 10 questions. Yeah.